say thank you for inviting me to this forum. And I would like to show uh, this presentation. Uh, it's called Advanced Bioproducts from Microalgae. This is uh, part of a project, an FOB project, it's called Algal Biotechnology for Advanced Bioproducts. It was funded by the European Union and Welsh Government. And we work together in an LG project and LG KPC. Uh, we work in the Department of Bioscience in the College of Science in Wallace, Belgium. So, so uh, my professional background, I did my agricultural engineering degree in Chile, in Northern Chile, since 95 to 2001. Um, I started working with microalgae in that time. And after that, I went to the, a private company, it's an environmental, and I worked as a lab man manager in Plan Tonantino for almost six years there uh, in Southern Chile. And uh, I did several thousands of uh, microalgae samples in a, in a monitoring program for salmon industry and mussels industry as well. Uh, in, in 2007, I flew to Spain and I did my PhD in Autonomous University of Barcelona. And I work as well in the Research Council of Spain, in, specifically in the Institute of the Sciences del Mar in Barcelona, and my thesis was about a specific group of microalgae, it's called dinoflagellate, uh, and the goal is to produce uh, liquids for bio biodiesel production. After that, I returned to the private company, and I worked for two years in southern Spain, in Alicante. Uh, I worked in the BFX company, Biofuel Sister, as a research manager, and the goal was to produce biomass for liquefaction and produce bio-oil and to produce uh, oil for specifically uh, omega-3. Omega and since March, I am working here in Swazi University. So today we're talking about, about microalgae. But uh, what is microalgae? Well, as I know that most of you work in the College of Medicine, I'm gonna start just the beginning. So <laughs> microalgae uh, are really tiny microscopic, uh, autotrophic, heterotrophic, or mixotrophic photosynthesizing organisms. They can live in many different kind of environment, uh, including fresh water, brackish water, or seawater. If you see any kind of pond and you see some green color or red, probably there are microalgae in it. Uh, there are different cell size from really few microns until millimeters. Uh, there are, well, two films is prokaryotic, uh, but mostly, most of the microalgae are eukaryotic cells. Prokaryotic is the cyanobacteria. Um, this kind of uh, organism, this is the first organism in the air. So uh, it's, it's really interesting, this organism. And we got uh, hundreds of thousands of different species, and for sure we will discover more in the, in the coming years. So, but how they can live in all those uh, different environments? Well, because they, they use the sun, the energy from the sun to produce chemical energy through photosynthesis. The photosynthesis uh, is a chemical reaction, so they use CO2 uh, plus water and the solar energy, and they produce a, a storage um, energy in form of sugar, or it can be a starch and they release oxygen to the air. So for that reason, this kind of organism are uh, really important. But uh, why they are so important for our lives? First of all, because they support all the food chain in the city. Uh, usually I explain to little kids that the phytoplankton, which is called microalgae, is like a grass in the air, but in the city. Yeah? So uh, these organisms uh, support all the food chains because uh, all the zooplankton uh, utilize as a food, phytoplankton, and then small sardine or even blue whale, big one, they support uh, this food chain. Also, now, uh, uh, for example, we are burning microalgae in our cars because the, the oil that we use every day is microalgae from millions and millions of years ago, so they are uh, really important. They're important as well because 
a half of the total CO2 emission in the atmosphere is obtained by these organisms. So, in fact, uh, now is uh, a big concern in the in the scientist world because uh, all the ocean it's becoming a little bit more acidic, and this will be in fact all the the, the, the food change in the ocean because uh, we have released too much CO2, as you know, and these organisms they cannot uptake all the CO2 that we are releasing. So. A really, really huge problem. And uh, if you don't know, this organism also uh, they produce an organic sulfuric compound. It's called DM DMS, and this DMS uh, plus UV plus steam plus uh, some kind of um, um, powder, uh, sand or a small particle, they produce clouds. So they are involved in all different kind of stuff in the in the. They are beautiful. We have different shapes, different colors, different pigments. The apps uh, you can see that they can be uh, changed. For example, that is called Alexandrum uh, catenella. It's really toxic. You can die if you eat just one cell. So it's really toxic. But also they can live in form of colony. And if the second one is called Peosiste, or even different shapes like uh, di diadem, that diadem, uh, or just simple bubble, like that one, or really fantastic shape, like the, the last one is a dinoflagella, the last one is called Dinophysis caudata. So we have different, this is just an example. But also they have adverse effects on the, on the environment. Why? They can produce, a, it's called harmful algae bloom. So, and, and this kind of bloom, they're uh, explosion in, in the sea when when they have uh, a, enough uh, nutrient concentration, they have life and right parameters, they can grow in explosive way and they can damage the aquaculture activity. For example, here we, we got a, a photograph in southern Chile, and then you can see this salmon cage, and they have they, they lost all the production of salmon in, in, in that um, bloom in 2002. That blooms is huge, so they can cover hundreds of kilometers, but you will see it later. Also, uh, they can have adverse effect on recreation activity. This is a photograph in northern Spain, and then you can see a, <coughs> a bloom of Alexandrium minutum, that is the cousin of the Alexandrium catenella, and they have to close all that beach because they can produce toxins or it can be harmful for human being and for, for the ecosystem as well. Or as you see here, this is a Coconutophoria bloom in Cornwall in southern England. And after this huge amount of biomass, uh, there are huge amount of bacteria as well, so they can uh, deplete the oxygen concentration in the sea and they can cause this uh, different damage to the ecosystem as well. This is a satellite image. With these photos, uh, I would I like to that this kind of uh, organisms they, they are distributed cosmopolitan in, in any part of the world they are growing. Well, it's a background of microalgae for biomass production. You know, production after the 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 oil crisis in the beginning of the 70s, there was a huge project in the in the state. Uh, in the energy department, and they <coughs> they do a lot of research in order to produce some kind of biofuel from these uh, organisms. Uh, after that project and so uh, other many projects, uh, we discover or uh, we discover that this kind of organism can produce high biomass production until uh, two grams per liter. Uh, they can synthesize more oil than terrestrial plant. The oil level inside the, these cells is between 20 to 50 percent. They can vary, it will depend on the growth pool. And they exceed high growth rate. In our term, they can double uh, the biomass in one day. And it can be a slow if you compare with bacteria, because they, they double in an hour or in a minute. But it's quite fast if you compare it on terrestrial plant. In fact, they are really, really efficient in terms of photosynthesis because uh, they can uh, 
the, the terrestrial park can use just 3% of the solar energy, and the, this my colleague can use 9% of this uh, energy to convert in chemical energy, so they are really efficient. Well, these are uh, the commonest my colleague use are really currently for different uh, co-option. For example, here we got spirulina platensis, that is a cyanobacteria to produce protein for human food or animal food. And then we have Corella protocolis, is for biomass production. And here we have a really small, tiny, and really strong cell, it's called Lantholoropsis ovulata, is for aquaculture feed, and for EPA production as well, for eicosapentanoic acid production. And here we have a fresh water species, it's called Hematococcus pluralis, it's for astaxanthin production. There is a pigment that uh, usually you will see in salmon, the, the, the orange color is for the, that pigment. Uh, how can we grow, how can we culture this, uh, this organism? Well, there are two different systems for, this, uh, or for the production of this organism. First of all, we have the open system. This is uh, some photograph in Hawaii and in, in California. The, this, uh, this system, this is a really shallow mixer or raised waste, ponds or tank. We can grow here freshwater species and seawater species, and those are the common species that they are growing in this kind of facility. They are huge, 100 meters or more. Um, then we have another kind of system, it's called closed system. Uh, here we have different photos. This is a photograph of the company that I worked uh, in Spain for two years. And this uh, photobioreactor is uh, uh, 54 cubic meter each. Uh, we have, uh, this is early, it's been just with air. You can move all the biomass inside of this photobioreactor. Here we have a uh, more cheaper but it's closed as well, a closed system is called flat pattern in Almeria, in southern Spain. And this is our biofence or photobioreactor here in Swansea University, it's a horizontal. So these are the main two systems for my quality production. Mm, what are the advantages and the drawbacks of this production system? Well, in closed system, the advantage is that we have high production. Uh, we can control some parameters as temperature, pH, CO2, or turbulence. So we can control this kind of parameter. Uh, they have low risk of contamination. And the final product is really pure. So mostly 99% of the culture is a monoculture. We have some contamination, but in, 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 in real terms, it's, it's really pure. Global high office. OPEX is the operation expenditure, so it's really hard to operate this, uh, this um, kind of system and have a high uh, capital, uh, capital expenditure. So to deploy one of these plants, you have to spend a lot of money to deploy this plant. Compare it with the open system, this kind of uh, system have a low OPEX and low CAPEX because you have to move some air and put in just the liner and can grow algae there. But what is the drawback? Low production, uh, high risk of contamination, and less purity of final product, maybe. We have other like uh, evaporation and other stuff, but basically this is the drawback of this system. Okay? So, well, uh, which kind of molecule we can extract from this organism? Well, for sure, lipids, protein, and carbohydrate. So, you know better than me that the, the main biological function of lipids is to energy storage, so to like convert of cell membranes, and it's important for signaling molecules. Protein, principally, is to like component of the cells, and bioregulation and immun immunological activities. And carbohydrate, mainly for energy requirement, and in some cases for cells as well. Here we have a microphotograph of uh, Alexandrian, and you can see here the lipids fraction. There are two fractions, polar and neutral. <coughs> polar is made in uh, waxes and phospholipid, and neutral fraction is triacylglyceride and triglyceride. So you can see here some oil droplets of um, these cells. Well, protein. Uh, uh, you can use protein as a food or as a as a um, stain, for example, this phytochemical protein that is a complex uh, with the chlorophyll and they they <coughs> activate the, the photon from the, the solar energy. And uh, we can use this carbohydrate uh, as a SAR or 
exopolysaccharides that they release to the medium in order to survive lo longer time. Which problem we have from lipids? Well, the last decade will be uh, was was really uh, productive in terms of uh, biodiesel production. Uh, what is biodiesel production? This is a transesterification reaction. We have the oil there, the triglyceride, plus the our alcohol is called methanol, and with a catalyst that can be acid catalyst or basic, usually soluble hydroxide, or even you can use the bases for this reaction. Then we obtain as a product the fatty acid methyl ester and as a byproduct glycerol. So this is uh, basically the biodiesel, the fatty acid methyl ester is biodiesel, but nowadays it's not feasible to produce in terms of energy, because the economy that is energy return of investment is negative, so you spend more energy than you obtain. So now it's not feasible to produce this kind of biodiesel. Probably in the coming decade will be will be more expensive the, you know, if we extract the oil and we can produce this uh, and biofuels. Uh, with the monounsaturated lipids, we can produce this kind of bioplastic uh, with this GHA. And the most uh, knowing thoughts from lipids from microalgae are the PUPAs or the polyunsaturated fatty acid because uh, we can produce three different uh, type of uh, PUPA, uh, lipidonic acid, uh, omega-3 or eicosapentanoic acid, and DHA and docohexanoic acid. In fact, this, this DHA is connected with the, the next one presentation because uh, I read yesterday that the 60% of the PUPA in the retina is DHA. 